myocard myocardial infarction size, looking at uh, sex differences in myocardial infarction outcomes, and you know, work that worked in some animal models and work in some other things uh, down at St. Mike's. Uh, then develop an interest in uh, this issue of uh, general issue of um, sex hormones and the cardiovascular system. And there isn't a whole lot of uh, published about this, uh, much less, of course, about testosterone uh, than about estrogens. So let's see, let's see where the audience uh, stands before we start with that. Uh, take a show of hands. So who thinks that testosterone is a friend of the cardiovascular system? Okay, I have a tough job here. So who thinks it is a, an, a foe, an enemy of the cardiovascular system? Okay, well, and well, I got I got enough people sitting on the fence that uh, that I I, uh, I may be able to uh, to uh, sway you one way or another. I'm not going to tell you uh, because otherwise I give a, give away my talk. Um, but um, yeah, enough people sitting on the fence. That's good. Uh, we start with lots of uh, neutrals. That's that's fine. So um, next, please. So no conflicts of, of interest regarding this presentation. <laughs> All right, on the next one, please. So these are my objectives tonight to talk about the role of testosterone in the regulation of the cardiovascular system. So what are the physiological effects of testosterone in the cardiovascular system? And then we'll, we'll review the effects of physiological testosterone replacement on cardiovascular risk factors. Now this is important because um, there are <clears throat> enough reasons to be worried about uh, supra-physiological uh, replacement with androgens. So we know bodybuilders and others, right? So we, uh, we know athletes and so there are no reasons there to be concerned. So I want to emphasize the physiological aspect uh, of what I'm talking about next. So uh, the important thing to remember is that testosterone has systemic effects. Of course there are uh, the, 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 uh, the effects that we know on, uh, on the sex organs. <coughs> But there are effects in multiple uh, different organs, and this is because uh, we have testosterone receptors. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those testosterone receptors, where they're located in the cardiovascular system. So now, um, testosterone deficiency syndrome is characterized by a deficiency in serum testosterone levels, or it can be changes in receptor sensitivity. Also, kind of like insulin resistance, you can develop also resistance to testosterone. Um, and those are some of the names, hypogonadism, uh, late onset hypogonadism. Uh, in, in some of the older literature, uh, the term on andropause was also used. Uh, next, please. So the manifestations, you're all very familiar with this. Just a, a very briefly review them. Uh, they start from very mild manifestations, like decreased libido, decreased uh, energy, vitality, uh, increased fatigue, to much more severe manifestations uh, such as osteopenia and osteoporosis, uh, and several other things in between. Next, please. Now, this is part of what I was telling you at, at the introduction of the talk, that not a whole lot is known about the effects of testosterone on the cardiovascular system. So a lot of work has been done with estrogens. Most of the work has been done with estrogens, but uh, testosterone is uh, much less well known. And <coughs> the deterioration of harmful effects of testosterone has been, have been suspected on the cardiovascular system. And, and this is why I, I put out that question there, whether there it's uh, good or bad. But this is mostly uh, based uh, on the non-medical use. So the non-medical use of androgenic steroids is considered uh, uh, drug abuse in, uh, in, in, in most countries. Now, it's important to remark that these are androgens, and we talked about this, that are what they call non-aromatizable. So they cannot be converted by an enzyme called ar aromatase. And I'll show you a little bit uh, more what that implies uh, later. Now, for instance, uh, in this paper uh, published in, in hypertension last year um, on testosterone and secondary hypertension, very interesting paper, but you know, here is sort of the, the, the bottom line. I summarize it for you. When you have young patients, you have athletic patients, when you have bodybuilders, 
and they have hypertension, you, you have to suspect the possibility that they have been abusing testosterone. So it is a secondary cause of hypertension uh, in these patients. So you can see that there are some harmful consequences of this uh, pharmacological abuse or supraphysiological uh, replacement, especially with those androgens that we were talking about that are not aromatizable. Um, so one of the reasons why um, <coughs> testosterone has been considered um, harmful for the cardiovascular system is because men develop coronary artery disease earlier than women, in average about 10 years earlier than women. So the implication from that, according to some people, is, well, it's because of testosterone. However, there's very little evidence of that. And it is more likely, according to, uh, uh, to what we've come to know over the uh, recent years, that the women are really more protected due to uh, estrogens um, rather than men being at greater risk of androgens. So it's the protection of estrogens what um, prevents women from developing coronary artery disease at the same age as men. And as a matter of fact, we start seeing the development of coronary artery disease in women about uh, 10 years after menopause. And by the time, by the time women are, uh, are 70 or 80, they, they've caught up pretty much with men in terms of, uh, of uh, coronary problems. Now, the other thing that has been extrapolated is that these individuals that use very uh, high doses of androgens, that abuse uh, these androgens, uh, they have abnormalities in the plasma lipid. So hypertension, they can get also uh, these lipidemias. And so they, this has been extrapolated to physiological levels of testosterone. So the, 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 the levels that a normal individual uh, has uh, may not reflect, may not have the same effect on uh, plasma lipids as in uh, those uh, individuals who abuse um, anabolic uh, androgens. Now, this is an interesting, this is a curious uh, fact here, a little bit of, of, of medical history trivia. <coughs> so those of you who are opera fans remember, may remember reading about the, uh, the castrati. So these were boys that mostly in Europe, they were castrated for puberty, so they wouldn't maintain the high pitch singing voice. Um, and Actually, uh, when I was in training in, uh, in, uh, in the States, when I was a cardiology fellow, um, in the 1980s, I went through um, uh, this store in, um, in the U.S. where the very, very old store, they had lots of, uh, of uh, old records. And I found a recording of the last castrato. The, uh, to, the, 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 before he died, they, they had the... There was enough time to record a phonograph uh, of this uh, of this singer, so it, it was, it's, that was about a hundred years ago. That's about the, the, when when the last ones uh, of, of the uh, these singers died. But uh, so there is a, an, an interesting study that showed that um, that when they match these opera singers with intact male singers, and they looked at uh, you know they look at their biographies and they look at how long they lived, there was no difference. So there was no difference between a, uh, let's say, a, a, the Castrati and a, a Placido Domingo or Luciano Pavarotti or, or you know, sort of, uh, uh, singers that were, not, uh, that were not castrated. And then uh, the, the, this then supports the concept that androgens did not have a significant negative effect on survival because if they did, then you would have expected these uh, individuals to live longer, and they didn't. So... I mentioned when I was telling you about the, uh, all the systemic effects, I mentioned that uh, these are mediated by receptors. So, and that these receptors are obviously are not located only to, uh, to sex organs, but are in many different tissues. Since today we're concentrating in the cardiovascular system, I tell you where they are located uh, in the cardiovascular system. So there are testosterone receptors in the smooth muscle cells, and there are testosterone receptors in the endothelium, 
uh, and there are also uh, testosterone receptors in the myocardiocytes. So they're, they're, they're quite prevalent in different cell types in the cardiovascular system. This is uh, fascinating because uh, it, it correlates, it, 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 uh, it uh, dovetails with my interest in endothelial function and vascular function. And um, it is that the fact that testosterone can act on the endothelium through, through different mechanisms, one that we call endothelium dependent because it depends on the activation of the nitric oxide synthase and the production, production of nitric oxide. So it's acting on the endothelium uh, through the, the, the testosterone receptors. Uh, now, but there are also recept uh, there are activities that are, uh, as we will see in the next slide, independent of the endothelium, uh, such as activities in blocking calcium uh, channels. So they'll be like a calcium channel blocker and they can lead to vasodilatation. So they open potassium channels uh, act a little bit like a calcium channel blocker and they lead to vasodilatation. So they're vaso-relaxing. Uh, Next. And this is what I was telling you about the, uh, this enzyme called uh, uh, aromatase. So under normal circumstances, physiologically, uh, testosterone can be converted by aromatase into estradiol, and this happens in men. And estradiol then uh, has estrogenic vascular effects in men. Antioxidant effects, vasodilatation, antiplatelet effects, nitric oxide production, antithorogenic effects, smooth muscle cell relaxation. So all of these are effects of testosterone that are mediated by the ability of this enzyme aromatase to convert testosterone into estradiol, into estrogen. And this is why, the, the, especially this synthetic uh, anabolic uh, androgens, bodybuilders and athletes, because they are not aromatizable, they cannot be converted. So you don't get the uh, beneficial effects uh, of estradiol on the, on the vascular shirt. And there are, uh, outside the cardiovascular system, also uh, receptors that have important implications uh, for cardiovascular health, uh, such as receptors in the liver, where uh, testosterone at physiological levels is known to decrease the production of low-density lipoproteins, triglycerides, lipoprotein A, and it be associated with central obesity, decreased central obesity. So. Testosterone deficiency uh, promotes central obesity. And, you know, and we know that. I mean, men, as we get a bit older, we get more central obesity, right? And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in part a function of a declining uh, testosterone levels. Now, what about then epi epidemiological evidence uh, linking uh, <coughs> Testosterone androgen levels and coronary artery disease. So, if we go back about uh, about uh, 12 years ago, um, there is a study that was done in uh, in Massachusetts that looked at uh, dihydroepiandrosteneodione and this, and that the same thing, uh, the sulfated version of that, and it looked it uh, there's an androgen. Of, uh, of adrenal origin. Uh, and what they saw here is that the higher uh, the levels, you see the higher levels here, were associated with less ischemic heart disease, death, hospitalization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and where individuals that had the lowest levels had a higher incidence of ischemic heart disease. And this is after adjusting, obviously, for cardiovascular risk factors, after adjusting for smoking, after adjusting for blood pressure, after adjusting for lipids and other things, seem to be an independent factor that correlated inversely with ischemic heart disease. And this is also um, a, a very interesting paper because what they did here, they, they took a, a several hundred uh, elderly men who were healthy, uh, living independently, and then they did, uh, they measured their testosterone levels, and they did what we call an intimal 
media thickness measurement of the carotid artery. So you can, with ultrasound, you can measure the combined thickness of the intima and the media of the carotid artery. And that has been shown to be a good marker of, um, uh, of, of cardiovascular events. And then, without giving this man any kind of, of, uh, of testosterone replacement or medications or of any kind, they followed them for five years and then they repeated the measurement of the uh, <coughs> intima media thickness of the carotid artery. And what happened? Well, it's very interesting because, see, this, is, this measures progression. And this is total testosterone, this is free testosterone. So what we see here is that those individuals that had the lowest levels were the ones that had more progression. Individuals that had the higher levels at baseline had less progression of this measurement of early atherosclerotic development in the carotid artery. So another study that suggests that, uh, that uh, the levels of testosterone that you have correlate with uh, the risk that you'll develop vascular disease in an inverse way. And this is also um, another interesting study. This is a bit, a bit more recent uh, from an Italian group. What they did is they took patients who presented to the cath lab <laughs> for uh, coronary angiograms. These were not unstable patients. These were not acute coronary uh, syndrome patients, patients that came in with was a positive stress test or, or uh, atypical chest pain or, or valvular heart disease or other reasons, so elective patients that went for cath. And, uh, and then did the study also measuring uh, testosterone levels. And then they use a score to measure the severity of the coronary artery disease, the number of lesions, the length of lesions, the number of vessels affected, the severity of lesions, etc. And again, there was a, an inverse correlation so that the uh, uh, <coughs> patients that came in with higher testosterone levels had less severe coronary artery disease. Again, after accounting for smoking and and blood pressure and other risk factors. So to, like, it was an independent uh, um, predictor of the severity of the coronary artery disease. All right, and uh, now what about cardiovascular risk factors? What do we know about that? So uh, next, please. There have been studies that have shown also um, that if we treat individuals that have low testosterone levels um, in, a, in a double blind randomized uh, placebo controlled trial that we can improve insulin resistance, that we can improve hemoglobin A1C, that we can improve um, waist circumference and waist, waist to hip ratios, decrease central uh, uh, obesity, and uh, uh, improve glycemic control and decrease insulin resistance. So, very interesting things. I mean, I'm not saying, and I don't want to, to uh, imply, and <coughs> I'm going to say now, and I'll say it at the end, that testosterone replacement prevents cardiovascular events. We don't know that. And I don't want to say it because we don't know it. That's, I want to make it very, very clear. And I don't want to advocate uh, the treatment of, uh, of patients with testosterone deficiency to prevent cardiovascular events because we don't know. And, and we've been burned already with the experience of estrogens, right? That we thought that, you know, they were, they were very good. And then when we did the big clinical trials, uh, that ten didn't turn out to be the case. And we can argue about those trials, whether the patients were properly uh, chosen, whether they were a bit too old, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the fact is, we don't have any evidence to say that we're going to prevent cardiovascular events by treating um, testosterone deficiency. So I want to put that out there and make it very clear. Um, but there is very interesting evidence that physiological replacement does improve a number of cardiovascular parameters. Now, what about uh, evidence of a, different, uh, of a different kind? So, prostate cancer is treated with uh, androgen deprivation therapy. 
So there has been an interest, mostly from a, a group at Hopkins and, uh, and a group at Harvard, to look at what the effects are of uh, ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, uh, in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. And what we can see here is that uh, in patients that are treated with androgen deprivation therapy uh, for prostate cancer, you see that they have a higher um, uh, <clears throat> insulin level, so there's more insulin resistance. Um, they have higher glucose levels. HOMA is a measure of, 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 of insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, and that's also uh, made worse by, uh, by uh, ADT. And, and leptin is uh, also an interesting molecule uh, in terms of lipid metabolism, which is also adversely affected uh, by androgen deprivation therapy. And next. And, uh, and this is uh, from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute from the NIH, um, showing the risk of cardiovascular mortality in patients who were treated with androgen deprivation therapy versus uh, matched individuals who were not treated with that kind of therapy. And you can see that there is a significant, uh, with time, there is a significant increase in cardiovascular mortality, both in uh, younger and older men uh, whose prostate cancers are treated with androgen deprivation therapy. So this is sort of a, a, an interesting uh, um, biological uh, experiment, if we want to call it that way, that uh, we suppress uh, androgens to treat the prostate cancer, but we're actually uh, making several cardiovascular risk factors worse. And this may account then for these findings that cardiovascular uh, mortality is increased when, uh, when we do this. Next. So what about uh, um, metabolic uh, syndrome um, and risk factors in these individuals that are treated with uh, ADT? Well, we see similar, very similar findings. We see an increased prevalence, so like almost three, threefold uh, increased prevalence of metabolic syndrome. Uh, again, about a threefold increase in abdominal obesity, hyperglycemia, hyperglyceridemia. So, parameters of the metabolic uh, syndrome, parameters of cardiovascular <laughs> risk uh, are increased in patients uh, whose prostate cancers are being treated by androgen deprivation. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. So now, talk to uh, about something that uh, is a bit closer to what we do in clinical practice. So we're going from the epidemiology, we're going from drawing uh, inferences from um, the, um, the area of prostate cancer, and we're going to go now to uh, this area here, which is very, very close to what we do, you know, stress tests and, and, uh, and um, anti-anginal uh, medications. This is the same group that I told you about uh, earlier, Rosano, in, in, uh, in Italy. And uh, this is the group that, that, uh, that did that study with the uh, coronary angiograms that show that the patients with lower uh, baseline testosterone levels uh, had m m a more severe coronary artery disease. So they did this other study. And what they did here was, these, these were patients that had coronary artery disease. So, they were all stable coronary artery disease patients. They were taking their beta blockers, their nitrates. Um, then they started an IV, and right before they put them on the treadmill, they gave them intravenous testosterone, and the other, the other um, uh, patients got a, a placebo, and then they serve as their own controls, and they come back and they do the opposite. And then they looked at two of the common parameters that we studied uh, with the stress testing, which is the time to one millimeter of ST segment depression and the total exercise time. And we see, as you can see, all, each one of these lines represents uh, one of the patients. Uh, some, some patients had a remarkable improvement, uh, others less, but all of them practically 
with you know some minor exceptions here, uh, had an improvement in the total exercise time and the time to an ischemic manifestation, which is one millimeter of ST segment depression. So this is interesting because you know this is just intravenous given right before the exercise. So there, there's there are some acute effects. And this is probably mediated through what we were talking about, vasodilatory properties, calcium channel blockade with, with vasorelaxation, um, induction of nitric oxide production in the endothelium, and so acting, if you will, a little bit like nitroglycerin in that regard, because we know nitroglycerin works through a pathway that's connected right to, to, uh, to, to nitric oxide pathway. So, and acute antianginal effects. Next. Now, you'll say, well, that's intravenous, not, uh, not very physiologic, that's acute, and yeah, sure, it's an interesting study, but those are limitations that it has. So this is different, though. this is a bit more chronic. So these are patients with chronic stable angina, and they were treated with transdermal testosterone, and as uh, you can see, then their uh, stress test was repeated at six weeks, at 14 weeks, and then you see that there is uh, an improvement uh, versus the placebo group. Placebo group improved a little bit, but not significant, and that's because there is a bit of a training effect, right, when, uh, when, um, uh, when, when you do repeated exercise uh, tests. Uh, but there's a much more significant improvement in the patients treated with transdermal testosterone, so both acute and chronic. Now, uh, this is also an interesting study and comes more from the uh, from the uh, endocrinology literature. And not going to I'm not going to claim to be an expert in that literature, but it's a, it's a interesting nevertheless because that have cardiovascular implications. So uh, there is uh, one of the uh, major trials with transdermal testosterone uh, followed patients for six months and showed uh, improvement in a number of parameters, as mentioned here. These were individuals with hypogonadism. Um, next. Uh, but then they extended the study to three years. So um, the, the patients in the six-month study, uh, they were extended for another 36 months, so for a total of 42 months of uh, transdermal testosterone uh, uh, ex uh, exposure and when you follow then the, the patient for 36 months then you see there's a decrease in total body mass uh, an increase in lean body mass and a decrease in fat body mass change correlating with the effects that we're talking about in central uh, obesity uh, in terms of lipoproteins uh, the, the, the effects are very small very small uh, but there was a significant, uh, a small but significant increase in HDL uh, with uh, trends towards a decrease in total cholesterol and, and LDL. At least there were no deleterious effects in, in total cholesterol or LDL. So that's one way of looking at it. Maybe it did not reach the statistical significance, the, the small decline, uh, but we did not see the increase that you see in the bodybuilders or, or, or uh, athletes that, that abuse uh, testosterone. So in those you see, besides increasing blood pressure, you see uh, lipid abnormalities. You didn't see that with the, um, um, with the uh, physiological replacement. So this is all to summarize uh, for you uh, a lot of studies and well we know, so this is an overview, uh, cardiovascular effects, androgen deprivation and androgen replacement therapy. So we know that in androgen deprivation, LDL is elevated, triglycerides are elevated. I show you that with the, uh, with the, with the uh, prostate cancer patients. HDL, some studies show it's reduced, some studies show that there's no significant effect. Blood pressure goes up, left ventricular mass goes up, uh, glucose intolerance goes up, and the the uh, the effects on vasodilatation exercise you know, they haven't really been well characterized. Uh, obesity increases, hypercoagulability is increased. Uh, Under replacement, so lots of studies, and I'm going to 
have time to show you uh, all of the studies, but this is why I put up this summary slide. But so LDL is either reduced or unchanged. Triglycerides unchanged or reduced. HDL increased, like in that uh, 36 month study, uh, or unchanged. So at worst, you're not going to get uh, <coughs> changes. And you may not get an improvement, but you know, no one is saying that you're going to use. Uh, testosterone replacement to improve lipids. I mean, you're doing it for, for other reasons. You're going treating that with the statins and, and, and other more effective uh, um, ways of treating the, um, uh, the dyslipidemia. And then if we look at exercise tolerance, I show you that uh, the treadmill uh, studies, vasodilatation is induced, obesity is induced. So uh, this summarizes some of the studies that I showed you already. Okay, so uh, well, the, the, the modalities that we have, and again, I'm not an endocrinologist, I'm not uh, an, an expert in testosterone replacement, I'm a cardiologist with an interest of the effect of testosterone in the cardiovascular system, but uh, I know uh, that you can replace it with injections, with, with tablets, with patches, and also uh, with a, a transdermal application with gels. And some of the potential benefits um, in terms of quality of life, there is a number of potential uh, benefits. Um, we talked about potential improvement in cardiovascular health, glycemic control, um, bone mineral density, I hadn't mentioned it, but I did say that osteoporosis is one of the consequences uh, of uh, androgen deficiency and reduced body fat. Uh, it's also one of the potentially beneficial effects. Now, uh, of course, we have to be um, very careful and we have to be mindful of the fact that uh, uh, testosterone replacement therapy is uh, absolutely contraindicated in patients with breast cancer, with prostate cancer, um, and it may worsen a number of conditions. So uh, this is important, so erythrocytosis, untreated uh, sleep apnea, congestive heart failure. Um, <clears throat> and next. I wanted to get, to get uh, here to the summary. So at, at the beginning, I told you that we don't know quite as much about the effects of testosterone on the cardiovascular system as, uh, as we know about the effects of estrogen on the cardiovascular system. So I bet there is enough there, at, at least to put together a talk. And I, 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 uh, I re review this literature frequently and try to update the talk and so, I gave you some, uh, some uh, fairly up-to-date information, um, and there have been some conflicting results with some of the older trials, and um, you know, more uh, potentially promising uh, effect with some of the newer research with better modalities of testosterone replacement and testosterone replacement in the physiological range. So supraphysiological doses, they're I, would, I wouldn't even say seems, but I think they are detrimental. Uh, but, you know, we know that um, the lower your testosterone levels, the higher cardiovascular events. So, at least physiologically, uh, there seems to be an inverse correlation there. Now, I told you about the potentially beneficial effects on the cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So if you take a uh, patient with hypogonadism and you replace them, you're going to get some potentially beneficial effects. And we went through some of the studies showing that. Um, we went to studies showing that there, there may be an increased LDL cholesterol, that uh, there is improvement in insulin sensi sensitivity, uh, that there is also some improvement in, in, coagula in hypercoagulability. And to me, this provides a measure of reassurance so we all have to be cautious, but to me, looking at the overall literature gives me a measure of reassurance uh, concerning potential adverse effects of testosterone replacement in, in older men. So I am reassured by some of this, and also, as I said before, we're not going to use this in, in any way, shape, or form to uh, with the, uh, under the impression that we're going to prevent cardiovascular events, there are some patients that are quite symptomatic from testosterone deficiency, and 
those patients may be helped in terms of quality of life by, by the replacement. Now, do we feel comfortable enough that we're not going to do any harm to the cardiovascular system um, in these patients who may already have established coronary artery disease or have a cardiovascular risk factors? Well, you know, that, that's a question I think we're going to ponder on in the next few minutes. And of course, uh, this is uh, a, a, something that's very important. Uh, more clinical trials are needed in terms of uh, long-term effects of testosterone replacement in